To measure the power of high-power industrial laser beams, the usual approach is to use a water-cooled thermal-tight power sensor and a suitable meter. The beam is absorbed by the sensor, and the resulting heat flow inside the sensor, which represents the beam's power, is measured. The heat is then removed by the flowing cooling water. Over our many decades of experience providing such measurement instruments, we've seen a number of avoidable problems come up repeatedly. We hope the information and recommendations in this video will help you avoid those avoidable problems. Here are the most common ones. Problem 1. Sudden sensor failure. The reading suddenly drops to zero and stays there, or suddenly becomes unstable. The cause in general is sensor overheating due to power, heat, coming in faster than it's being taken out. If this heat builds up enough, one of the sensing element's solder joints can melt and disconnect, or soften and become susceptible to breakage due to mechanical stress. Note that sometimes, rarely, the disconnect could be intermittent, reconnecting when the sensor cools, but failing again when the sensor next heats up. The strange part, though, is that users generally know what the maximum power rating of their sensor is. And yet we've seen cases where even though the user verified that the maximum power rating was not exceeded, the problem happened. The explanation in most cases turns out to be surprisingly simple. A brief moment in which the sensor was not being properly cooled. For example, perhaps first the beam was turned on, and then a moment later the cooling water flow was activated. That moment might be all it takes for the damage to happen, or at least begin. Problem 2. Unexpected localized laser damage. By unexpected, I mean a situation in which the overall power density seems to be within the specified damage threshold limits, and yet damage happens anyway. Obviously, the direct cause is localized power density being above the specified damage threshold. In situations where the overall power density was not above the limit, a spot in which it was above the limit could be caused by one of the following. One, hot spots in the beam. The distribution of power density within the beam's cross-section might not be uniform and there might be local areas of higher power density, hot spots, of which the user might be unaware. 2. A decentered beam. To understand this, let's look at what that reflective cone in the sensor's aperture does. It reflects the incoming beam radially outward with some divergence, so that by the time it reaches the absorber surface, the cylindrical wall around the cone, it has expanded and the power density is now lower than it had been in the incoming beam. If the beam is not properly centered on the cone, though, the distribution of the power density on the absorber will not be uniform. There will be areas of higher and lower power density, and even though it seems to the user that all specification limits were being observed, the result could be unexpected damage. Problem 3. Water flow meter failure. Some sensors measure laser beam power by measuring the temperature rise of the cooling water and its flow rate. These two pieces of information can be combined to derive the beam power. We once had a number of such sensors failing, and initial inspections didn't find any of the ordinary problems. Detailed examinations found that the water flow meters inside the sensors had been damaged. The culprit? It turned out to be forced air that had been used to purge the sensor's water channels of water residue before putting the sensors away after use. We'd like to share some best practices with you now, some tips that'll help you avoid these and similar problems. 1. Water flow. The cooling water flow should be on before the beam is turned on. Also, be sure to check the specifications of the water flow flow rate, temperature, and so on. 2. Increase laser power gradually. Sudden jumps in power and the resulting jump in heat flow can cause mechanical stress in the solder joints in the sensing element, potentially leading to a disconnect. 3. 
for sensors that use an internal water flow meter, such as this one, which measures up to 6 kilowatts. Bursts of high velocity or high pressure water or air will damage the flow meter. The following cautions should always be observed. Water flow should be started at a low rate and gradually increased. Pressurized air should not be used to remove water residue from inside the sensor. It will damage the flow meter. On the other hand, we don't want to store the sensor with water in the channels as this could have corrosive effects. Water in the sensor should be allowed to simply drip out. Tilting and turning the sensor can help. Ophir supplies these sensors with plastic plugs that close the water inlet and outlet when the sensor is being stored or shipped. 4. Observe the specified power density limits. This includes local power density, so be sure your beam doesn't have hotspots. A good beam profiler is the best way to verify this. Note that for sensors with a reflective cone, the maximum power density is not just one number. 5. For sensors with a reflective cone, keep the beam properly centered as specified in the sensor's data sheet. Often, the aperture covers have a target on them to help with the alignment. 6. The sensor should not be opened under any circumstances. These are precision measurement instruments that are not user serviceable. And 7. Here's an important tip when using a reflective cone-based sensor with a converging beam. We recently saw this lesson learned the hard way. Hopefully, it will now help you avoid this. Imagine you're measuring your laser beam's power after a scanner lens with a long focal length. You've even made sure that the beam's size on the sensor's alignment target on the front flange of the sensor is large enough. There are three potential pitfalls that you should consider. One, the guide beam that you just used to check the beam size might be slightly larger than the actual beam. Two, depending on the detailed design of that sensor, the beam might still have a long distance to go between the front flange surface and the actual absorber. So a converging beam, even if it's large enough at the front flange, might become a lot smaller by the time it reaches the absorber, which could result in unexpected laser damage. 3. The beam may seem centered on the alignment target at the entrance to the sensor's aperture, but since the beam converges, a slight decenter or angle can cause the now smaller beam at the cone to be decentered. As we saw, this would mean that the entire beam will be focused to one spot on the absorber instead of being sprayed uniformly across the entire circumference. Again, unexpected damage. The bottom line, if you're using a converging beam with a reflective cone-based sensor, when you check that your power density is safely within the specified damage threshold limits, make sure the beam size you're taking into account is the beam size at the absorber surface, which might not be the same as the beam size just outside the sensor's front surface. If practical, working after the focal point of the beam is one easy way to avoid accidental focusing. To learn more, contact Ophir directly through our local representatives or visit our website.